about the Thindadad. 1. According to Parsi tradition, the Vendidad is the only Nosk out of the 21 that was preserved in its entirety. This is a statement to which it is difficult to trust, for if there is anything that shows how right the Parsis are in admitting that the Avesta is only a collection of fragments, it is just the fragmentary character of the Vendidad. You could say it's an ac more or less accurate statement, but you still are left with less than one, right? Um, the word Vendidad is a corruption of Vida Evo Dotem, anti demoniac law, and is sometimes applied to the whole of the law. Vendidad Sada. The Vendidad has often been described as the book of the laws of the Parsis. It may be more exactly called the Code of Purification, a description, however, which is itself so far correct that the laws of purification are the object of the larger part of the book. The first two chapters deal with mythical matter without any direct connection with the general object of the Vendidad and are remnants of an old epic and cosmogonic literature. The first deals with the creations and counter-creations of Ahura Mazda and Engra Ma'enyu. The second speaks of Yima, the founder of civilization, although there was no particular reason for placing them in the Vendidad as soon as they were admitted into it, they were put at the beginning because they referred to the first ages of the world. The three chapters of a mythical character about the origin of medicine were put at the end of the book for want of any better place, but might as well have been kept apart, as was the so-called Hathopt Nosk fragment. There is also another mythical foregard. The 19th, which, as it treats the revelation of the law by Ahura to Zarathustra, would have been more suitably placed at the beginning of the Vendidad proper. That is, as the third Fargard, other 17 chapters deal chiefly with the religious observances, although mythical fragments or moral digressions are met with here and there, which are more or less artificially connected with the text, and which are most probably not written along with the passages which they follow. And perhaps it all kind of blended into one, but they wrote in more laws, um, particularly as the text got in smaller um, Two, a rough attempt at a regular order appears in these 17 chapters. Nearly all the matter contained in the eight chapters from 5 to 12 deals chiefly with impurity from the dead and the way of dispelling it. But the subject is again treated here and there and other Fargards. And matter irrelevant to the subject has also found its way into the same eight Fargards. Fargards 13 and 14 are devoted to the dog, but must be completed with the part of the 15th. Fargards 16, 17, and the most part of 18 deal with several sorts of uncleanliness, and their proper place should rather have been after the 12th Fargard. Fargard 3 is devoted to the earth. Fargard 4 stands by itself as it deals with a matter which is treated only there, namely civil and penal laws.
No better order prevails within these several parts. Prescriptions on one and the same subject are scattered about through several bargards without any subject being treated at once in a full and exhaustive way, and that this occasions needless repetitions. The main cause of this disorder was, of course, that the advantage of order is rarely felt by Orientals. Well, perhaps just not the order that um, a Westerner would guess would be the thing. Um, but it was further promoted by the very form of exposition adopted by the first composers of the Vendidad. This law is revealed by Ahura and a series of answers to questions put to him by Zarathustra. That word form of the Vendidad has been often compared with that of the books of Moses. But in reality, in the Bible, there is no conversation between God and the lawgiver. The law comes down unasked, and God gives commands, but gives no answers. In the Vendidad, on the contrary, it is the wish of man, not the will of God, that is the first cause of the revelation. Man must ask of Hura, who knows everything, and is pleased to answer. The law is the question of Ahura, in Ahuri Frasno. And, as these questions are not of a general character, but refer to details, the matter is much broken into fragments, each of which consisting of a question, with its answer, stands by itself. As an independent passage, we shall treat the following pages, first of the laws of purification, then of the civil laws, and lastly, of the penalties, both religious and civil. And we can think in the Bible, the bit where Abraham's questioning the back and forth, you know, considering the people of Lot. A. Oh, well, three. The first object of man is purity. Yazda o. Purity is for man, next to life, the greatest good. Purity and impurity have not in the Vendidad the exclusively spiritual meaning which they have in our languages. They do not refer to an inward state of the person, but chiefly to a physical state of the body. Impurity or uncleanliness may be described as the state of a person or thing that is possessed of the demon, and the object of purification is to expel the demon. The principal means by which uncleanliness enters man is death, as death is the triumph of the demon. When a man dies, as soon as the soul is parted from the body, the drug nasu, or corpse drug, falls upon the dead from the regions of hell, and whoever thenceforth touches the corpse becomes unclean, and makes unclean whomsoever he touches. The drug, or, you know, druj is how people usually say this, but, um, is expelled from the dead by means of the sagdid. The book of the dog a four-eyed dog, or a white one with yellow ears, is brought near the body and is made to look at the dead. As soon as he has done so, the dog flees back to hell. And in the shape of a fly, a fly that came to the smell of the dead body, was thought to be the corpse spirit. They came to take possession of the dead, and the name of Aframan, the uh, Beelzebub, which etymologically is not Lord of the Flies, Baal Sebub is Lord of the Flies, but, um, you know, we see the connection there. The dark is expelled from the living, whom she is seized through their contact with the dead. By a process of washings with ox urine, 
Gomez are Nirong and with water combined with the Sagdid uh, the Sagdid. The real import of these ceremonies is shown by the spells which accompany their performance. Perish O fiendish drug perish O brood of the fiend perish O word of the fiend perish away O drug perish away O drug perish away O drug perish away to the regions of the north nevermore to give unto death the living word of the Holy Spirit. Now it's said that um the devil camps himself up in the north. Um there are people that say the devil's headquarters on earth are in water and the north, you know, pole kind of, you know. Um but some people say it's the like the antipode of Mecca or Medina or Jerusalem or something, um, which all happen to be in the South Pacific, where people say that Cthulhu is, you know, um, but <laughs> which is nowhere near as reliable as references any of those others. But um, but the fact that that happens were three of the sites that people have mentioned um, in different faith communities. Um, Thus, in the death of a man, there is more involved than the death of one man. The power of death, called forth from hell, threatens from the corpse, as from a stronghold, the whole world of the living, ready to seize whatever may fall within his reach. And from the dead defiles the living, from the living rushes upon the living, when a man dies in a house, there is a danger for three days, lest somebody else should die in that house. The notion or feeling out of which these ceremonies grew was far from unknown to the other Indo-European peoples, but was peculiar to Mazdaism, was that it carried it to an extreme and preserved a clearer sense of it, while elsewhere it grew dimmer and dimmer and faded away, in fact, when the Greek going out of a house where a dead man lay, sprinkled himself with water from the Ar Danion at the door. It was death that he drove away from himself. The Vedic Indian, too, though his rites were intended chiefly for the benefit of the dead, considered himself in danger, and while burning the corpse, cried aloud, Away, go away. O death, injure not our sons and our men. Rigveda 10.18 one, four, as to the rites by means of which the drug is expelled, they are the performance of myths. There is nothing in worship but what existed before. In mythology, which we call a practice, is only an imitation of those that people call gods. And amoy u sis thaps. As man fancies, he can bring about the things he wants by performing the acts which were supposed to have brought about things of the same kind when practiced by those considered to be gods. Well, again, you don't have to treat the heroes as gods to take on myths like that. Um, certainly a Christian would believe that you have to uh, be Christ-like and you consider Christ to be a god rather than a human exemplar um, would be what they would claim there, but the Parsis being at a loss to find four-eyed dogs interpret the name as meaning a dog with two spots above the eyes but it is clear that the two-spotted dog Services are only accepted for want of a four-eyed one, are of a white one with yellow ears, which amounts to saying that there were myths, according to which the deaf fiend was driven away by dogs. Of that description, there surmines one, at once, of the three-headed Kiberos, watching 
at the doors of hell, and still more of the two brown, four-eyed dogs of Yama, who guard the ways to the realms of death. In practice, they are still less particular. The saga deed may be performed by a shepherd's dog, by a house dog, by a Ohunazka dog, or by a young dog. As birds of prey are fiend smiting as the dog, they are Nasu smiters like him, and the one may appeal to their service when there is no dog at hand. The identity of the four eyed dog in the Parsi tradition, uh, uh, well, of the Parsi with Kebaras and Yama's dogs appears. Moreover, from the, from the Parsi tradition, that the yellow-eared dog watches at the head of the Kinbat Bridge, which leads from this to the next world, and with this barking, drives away the fiend from the souls of the Holy Ones, lest he should drag them to hell. Allusions to this myth are found in Fargard 13, 9, and 1930. The commentary on Fargard 13, 17 has, There are dogs who watch over the earthly regions. There are others who watch over the 14 heavenly regions. The birth of the yellow-eared dog is described in the Ravat as follows. Ormazd, wishing to keep the body of the first man, Gayomart, from the assaults of Ahraman, who tried to kill him, cried out, O thou yellow-eared dog, arise! And directly the dog barked and shook his two ears, and the unclean Satan and the fiends, when they saw the dreadful looks of the yellow-eared dog and heard the, his barking, were sore afraid, and fled down to hell. Wherever the corpse passes by, death walks with it. All along the way, it is gone. From the house to its last resting place, a spirit of death is breathing and threatening the living. Therefore, no man, no flock, no being, whatever, that belongs to the world of Ahura is allowed to pass by that way until the deadly breath that blows through it has been blown away to hell. The four-eyed dog is made to go through the way three times, or six times, or nine times, while the priest helps the look of the dog with his spells. Dreaded by the drug. Five. The use of Gomez in cleaning the unclean is derived from an old mythic conception. And nowadays it's known as Vasa Bratagna. The storm floods that cleanse the sky of the dark fiends in it were described in a class of myths as the urine of the gigantic animal in the heavens. As the floods from the bowl above drive away the fiend from the entity, so they do from a man here below. They make him free from the death demon, Fra Nasu, and the death fiend flees away hellwards, pursued by the fiend's mighty spell. Perish thou, O drug, nevermore to give over to death the living world of the good spirit. 6. An uncleanliness is nothing else than the contagion of death, and it is at its greatest intensity when life is just departing. The Nasu, at that moment, defiles ten persons around the corpse. When a year is over, the corpse defiles no longer. Thus, the notion of uncleanliness is quite the reverse of what thought elsewhere. The corpse, when rotten, is less unclean than the body still, 
all but warm with life. Life defiles least when it looks most hideous, and defiles most when it might look majestic. Well, the rot taking over. You know, initially, the exposure to disease that may be contagious could be said to be the strongest around death. But um, the cause in that, in the latter case, the death demon has just arrived in the fullness of his strength, whereas the former case, time, has exhausted his power. 7. As the focus of the contagion is in the corpse, it must be disposed of so that death may not spread about. On this point, the old Indo-European customs have been completely changed by mustaism. The Indo-Europeans either burnt the corpse or buried it. Both customs are held to be sacrilegious in the Avesta. Well, we certainly shouldn't uh, coat the bodies with poisons and use elaborate um, coffins and stuff like this. Um, the person can say that's at least wasteful, but the amount of pollution that you know you can see on my graveyard videos that that affects the you know it's, it's just not necessary. Eight. The view originated from the notion of the holiness of the elements being pushed into an extreme. The elements, fire, earth, and water, are holy, and during the Indo-Iranian period, they were already considered so. And in the Vedas, they are worshipped as godlike beings. Yet, this did not prevent the Indian from burning his dead. Death did not appear to him so decidedly a work of the demon, and the dead man was a traveler to the other worlds whom fire kindly carried to his heavenly abode on his undecaying flying pinions wherewith he killed the demons the fire was in that as the sacrifice the entity that goes from earth to heaven from man to what's uh, from man to god the mediator the entity most friendly to man in Persia, it remains more distant from him, being an earthly form of the ele eternal, infinite, godly light. Ichidem qualitas delapsum. No death, no uncleanness can be allowed to enter it, as it here as it is here, below the purest offspring of the good spirit, the purest part of this pure creation. Its only function is to repel the fiends with its bright blazing. In every place where Parsis are settled, an everlasting fire is kept. The Bahram fire, which, preserved by a more than vestal care, and ever fed with perfumes and dry, well-blazing wood, Whichever side its flames are brought by the wind, it goes and kills thousands and thousands of fiends, as Bahram does in heaven. The necessities of life oblige us to employ fire for profane uses. It must be only for a time, an exile on our hearth, or in the oven of the potter, and it must go thence to the right place of the fire the itcho, got to, the altar of the Bahram fire, there to be restored to the dignity and rights of its nature. At least let no gratuitous and wanton degradation be inflicted upon it, even blowing it with the breath of the mouth is a crime. A custom still existing with the Tazik and Iranian tribe in eastern Persia. Manu has the same prescription. Burning the dead is 
the most heinous of sins. Well, it uses excess wood. Um, it's not the best one on the environment. Bearing really is. I mean, plain burial. Um, in the times of Strapo, it was a capital crime. And the Avesta expresses the same when putting it in the number of those sins for which there is no atonement. Water was looked upon in the same light, bringing dead matter to it, is as bad as bringing it to the fire. The Magat are said to have overthrown a king for having built bathhouses, as they cared more for the cleanliness of water than for their own. King Balash It seems as if there were a confusion between Balash and Kabat. At any rate, it shows that baiting smacked of heresy. Jews were forbidden to perform the legal ablutions. Well, Judaism really is post-540, um, but certain things would have existed before that. Um, not less holy was the earth or at least it became so. There was a female entity who lived in her, Smenta Armaete. No corpse ought to defile her sacred breast. Burying the dead is like burying... Uh, burying the dead is, like burying the dead, a deed for which there is no atonement. It was not always so in Persia. The burning of the dead has been forbidden for years, while the burying was still general. Cambyses had aroused the indignation of the Persians by burning the corpse of Amasis. Yet, years later, Persians still buried their dead, but the priests already felt scruples and feared to defile an entity. You know, a spiritual entity, I mean... Um, Later on, with the ascendancy of the Magian religion, the sacerdotal observances became the general law. Well, they made things more difficult as time went on, obviously. Still, the worship of the earth, or, well, uh, exaggeration of the sacredness of the earth, you could say. Um, I don't think they treated it, I don't think they considered the earth a god or... Um, the worship the entities of this, that, and the other were not, were the same. it wasn't the same as worshiping the earth itself, seems not to have so deeply penetrated the general religion as that of fire. The laws about the disposal of the dead were interpreted by many. It was seen as intended only to secure the purity of the water and fire. They thought that they might be at peace with religion if they had taken care to bury the corpse so that no part of it might be taken by animals to fire or water. What were the... Uh, well, ten. Therefore, the corpse is laid on the summit of a mountain far from man, from water, from tree, from fire, and from the earth itself as it is separated from it by a layer of stones or bricks. Moreover, the dogma is ideally separated from the ground by means of a golden thread, which is supposed to keep it suspended in the air. Special buildings. The dogmas were erected for this purpose. There, far from the world, the dead were left to lie, beholding the sun. The dogma is a round building and is designed by some, is designated by some writers. The Tower of Silence, a round pit about six feet deep, is surrounded by an annular stone pavement about seven feet wide, on which the dead bodies are placed. This place is enclosed all around by a stone wall some twenty feet high, 
with a small door on one side for taking the body in. The hole is built up of and paved with stone. The pit has communication with three or more closed pits at some distance into which the rain washes out the liquids and the remains of the dead bodies. The manners and customs of the Parsis, Bombay mentions this. A dogma is the first building the Parsis erect when settling in a new place. Well, it's, it's good that the rituals can be performed without a special building. Um, I mean, the daily life rituals, and that sort of thing. The Avesta and the commentator attach great importance to that point. It is as if the dead man's life were thus prolonged, since he can behold the sun. Grant us that we may long behold the sun, says the Indian Rishi. 11. Not every corpse defiles man but only those of such beings as belong to the world of Ahura. They are the only ones in whose death the demon triumphs. The corpse of an Ahramanian creature does not defile. All its life was incarnate death. The spring of death that was in it is dried up with its last breath. It killed while alive. It can do so no more when dead. It becomes clean by dying. None of the faithful are defiled by the corpse of an Ashima-oga or a Kraftstra. Nay, killing them is a pious work, as it is killing Ahriman himself. Well, I would not recommend going about trying to extinguish the species that you don't like. 12. Not only real death makes one unclean, a partial death too. Everything that goes out of the body of man is dead and becomes the property of the demon. The going breath is unclean. It is forbidden to blow the fire with it and even to approach the fire without screening it from the contagion with a penome. Parings of nails and cuttings or shavings of hair are unclean and become weapons in the hands of the demons unless they have been protected by certain rites and spells. Any phenomenon by which the bodily nature is altered, whether accompanied with danger to health or not, was viewed as a work of the demon, and made the person unclean in whom it took place. One of these phenomena, which is a special object of attention in the Vendidad, is the uncleanliness of women during their menses.